And here we are again for another Chem Honors lesson. And this time we're going to be looking at um, how to do an acid-base titration. And this is going to introduce us to the um, both the concept of titrations and to the lab that is accompanying this um, or will be will be accompanying this particular um, lesson. Actually, it'll be a separate lesson because the lab is going to be different from the homework that this, this goes along with. So um, a titration is just a, uh, an analytical technique in which we're going to precisely measure or determine the concentration of a solution whose, unknown, whose solution concentration is unknown. And the solution that we're going to measure is either going to be an acid or a base concentration and in fact in the lab you're going to um, you're going to apply this to both an acid and a base and that will start to be explained in the lab and in the the video that goes along with the lab itself now an acid base titration uses a neutralization reaction so we're going to neutralize the acid in the base which is a form of a double replacement reaction in which we take the acid and the base together and when they react, they form a salt. Now the salt is that ionic compound that's not an acid or a base. And in the salt, the cation comes from the base, and we'll see that in a moment, and the anion comes from the acid. And then the other product of the neutralization reaction is water. So the simplest reaction we have here, neutralization reaction, is between hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Now I want to make clear that you understand that this is not not going to be a Bronsted reaction. In other words, we're not going to have a transfer from the acid to the base specifically. There will be that, but because the base is a an ionic compound and because the acid is a strong acid, these guys are going to split apart and I'll show you that in a moment with the ionic equation. So in this double replacement reaction, we're going to have the hydrogen is going to come together with the hydroxide and the sodium is going to come together with the chlorine, or the chloride. And so we're going to make sodium chloride. And remember, sodium is a plus one, chloride is a minus one, so we have a one-to-one -one ratio. That's going to be aqueous, so this is our salt that we make. And we can write water as HOH, and I want you to think about the water as HOH. That way, you can think about the hydrogen coming from the acid and the hydroxide coming from the base, and of course, that is a liquid. Now, back in reactions, we talked about net ionic equations, and you can write a great net ionic equation for this to see exactly what's going on. If we split everything apart, and I'm going to drop the aqueous and the liquid just to save room here. We're going to have hydrogen ion plus the chloride ion. So this is a strong acid. And because it's a strong acid, it 100% associates, so we get the ions. Sodium, chloride, uh, sodium hydroxide is a soluble ionic compound. And so we're going to make Na plus and hydroxide. Sodium chloride is a soluble ionic compound. And so we have Na plus and chloride. And water is a covalent compound that does not split apart. So any pure covalent compound like water doesn't associate. And so when we go to write the net ionic equation for this, we can cancel out the chlorines, the chlorides on both sides. We can cancel out the sodiums on both sides. And what we're going to be left with, the net ionic equation, whenever we titrate a strong acid with a strong base, and this is really the driving force of this reaction, is the combination of hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion to make water. And again, this water, this is the reverse of the uh, KW reaction that we saw the other day. And this has such a large equilibrium constant in the other direction that... Um, or in the forward direction that this essentially goes to completion. In fact, we're going to see that most of these reactions, as long as we have something strong, either a strong acid or a strong base, these reactions go 
100%. There's no equilibrium that you have to worry about. So that's the basic idea behind titration, kind of reaction we're going to do. Now, on the right here, I have a titration curve in which we are following titration of a strong acid, such as hydrochloric acid, by addition of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide and the volume of the sodium hydroxide. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the pH. So basically, we monitor the pH of the titration, and we, we know how much uh, acid or base we put in, and we can use that to figure out the concentration. We'll get to that in a moment when we get to the stoichiometry. A couple of important places on the titration curve. So on this titration curve, we're going to start with a strong acid. So our pH starts at 1. This is going to be 0.1 molar of a strong acid, a pH starting at 1. And as we add sodium hydroxide, the pH is slowly going to come up. It's slowly going to come up until we get near to this point right here. At this point, at 25 milliliters, we're reaching what's called the equivalence point. The equivalence point is the point in the titration where the original acid and base are exactly reacted. There's no excess of anything, so no excess reactant. Now, in order to do that, we have to have the moles of the hydrogen ion from the acid is exactly equal to the moles of the hydroxide from the base. And so I'm going to highlight this because this is an important concept that anytime you have the equivalence point, the moles of the acid, the moles of the hydrogen ion, sorry, that came from the acid is equal to the moles of the hydroxide that came from the base, and they're going to neutralize themselves according to the net ionic equation. And at that point, at that point, we get a large change in the pH right at the equivalence point. So you can see this large change in pH, which switch back to green, as we come up through that equivalence point, which for this particular case occurs, the equivalence point occurs at a neutral pH of 7. Uh, we'll talk more about when it doesn't, when that doesn't happen in the next lesson. And there are times when that doesn't happen. Now, normally for a titration, you would stop here. Once you get to this point, you would stop. If you were to continue, though, you get to excess hydroxide. And this would be the curve that you would see if you were to plot the pH as a function of the sodium hydroxide, uh, volume of the sodium hydroxide added. Now, the problem we have with acid-base reactions is that they are, acids and bases are both clear colorless solutions. So you need to know when your reaction is over. And in order to do that, you're going to use an acid-base indicator. The acid-base indicator is an organic dye, and you can see the model of the dye down below for, for the lab that we're actually going to be using. Organic dye that changes color as the pH changes, and you can see that you have a drastic, when you have a drastic change in the pH, we're going to get a change in color. The particular acid base indicator that we're going to use is called phenolphthalein. And we use the phenolphthalein because it has a very dramatic change in color. It goes from colorless in acidic solutions to pink or magenta in basic solutions. So as in, in an acidic solution, it's fully protonated. What does that mean? It has protonated. It has the protons in the acidic places. And then when you add base to it, now the, the indicator itself does not drive the solution chemistry. It's present in such small amount that the solution chemistry basically drives the indicator. So any excess hydroxide is going to take, take those OHs, or take the H, sorry, off, not the OH. It's going to take the H off. And there's a little rearrangement of the molecule as well. And so then in the basic solution, we get the fully deprotonated, deprotonated 
solution uh, um, uh, molecule and we get this this nice bright pink now in the video that I'm gonna show you for the lab they make a little mistake they they talk about using and they do use uh, phenolphthalein but they circle another one I think it's bromothymol blue and bromothymol blue we're gonna use that um, as an indicator to show you something else when we get to chapter 16 but bromothymol blue starts off as yellow in acid and will change to blue. The problem with that is looking for the intermediate color, which is green, which is like the con combination of the, the, the two, is very difficult to stop right at the end point. Phenolphthalein is beautiful because the slightest hint of pink it tells you that you're at your end point. Oh, I'm using the term end point here. The end point is actually the, the, the point at which the pH changes color. So the pH changes color at the end point, or sorry, the indicator changes color at the end point. And you want that end point to be as close to the equivalence point as possible. Um, and in a future class, you can learn about how to, how to choose the correct indicators and how you're going to solve problems based on finding the correct indicator at the correct endpoint. For now, we're just going to stick with good old phenolphthalein because it works for the kind of reaction we're going to do. So titration setup is shown diagrammatically down to the left and we have a whole bunch of things going on. We've got the burette. Burette, we've seen this burette before. The burette is this, this device that has a uh, stopcock or a valve and has a little nozzle at the end that you can drip your, your solution out of. It's going to be filled with a solution, the titrant, that's either the acid or the base. In the case of our lab, we're going to have the, the base in there. And in the case of this example down below, we're also going to have the base in there. So we'll get to the example down below in a moment, but the sodium hydroxide is going to be in the burette and it's going to start off filled up. So you're going to start off with the, the burette filled up um, near the top. It doesn't have to be uh, all the way up to the top. Uh, the funnel up there is just to help fill the burette. The clamp, of course, holds the burette. Down below, we're going to have whichever, um, whichever solution is not in the burette is going to be in our reaction container. And the reaction container in this case is going to contain um, 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid was gotten, was put into there by, um, by pipetting it, either using a graduated pipette or volumetric pipette. I think in our lab, we would have used a volumetric pipette to get exactly 10.00 milliliters of our vinegar. And of course, the indicator. Don't forget to have that indicator there. And so the way your reaction would work, you'd start off with your sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and at the start, this is our phenolphthalein. So we're gonna put like three drops of phenolphthalein into our, into our solution. Not so much that it's going to affect the chemistry, but enough so that we can see the change. A good titration will end when you just have this very faint pink and you're at the equivalence point. And if we were in our lab, one of the competitions we'd be having was to see who could get the faintest pink as their end point. If you go too far, if you over titrate, you'll get a darker pink color and even though it looks prettier, um, that's not what we're going for. So part of the lab would be trying just to get that technique down. Now, once we have the technique down, and you'll see how that works in the video, all we need to do is figure out what our data, uh, data is going to be and then what the calculations are going to be. So you're going to start off, you're going to know the volume of the acid. In this particular case, we also know the molarity. In your lab, we're going to turn it around. Uh, we're going to know the molarity. Well, you're going to actually calibrate. You're going to see how that's done. Calibrate 
the molarity of the of the sodium hydroxide using um, a solid acid called potassium hydrogen phthalate, KHP. And then once you know that, we can then turn around and use that molarity. And I'll explain some of this when we go over this in lab, uh, in, in class. Uh, you'll use that molarity then to figure out the molarity of your, of your acetic acid and vinegar. But in this particular case, we're going to use the known amount of acid and its concentration to figure out the concentration of the base. So we have the volume and the concentration of the acid. In order to get the concentration of the base, we need to know what volume of base is necessary to neutralize that volume of acid. And so to the right here, I have, I have reproduced two, um, uh, two uh, images from the start and the end of a titration. And you can see the markings, nine down to 10. Notice that these markings go down. The reason for that is the volume starts off near the top of the burette, and as it goes down, the amount of, of the titrant increases, so the numbers are getting big, bigger. And what the, the burette is gonna actually tell you is how much of the titrant you put in. Starting here, if we read this properly, I'm going to read that the, the bottom of the, um, of the meniscus is looking like it's at about 9.63. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I'll get to that in a moment. I didn't, I didn't give you the reaction here. The reaction is going to be, now this one is an interesting one because we have two hydrogens here. We're going to have sodium and SO4 coming together. Remember, we're going to, because this is a, a strong acid and a strong base, uh, this reaction is going to go 100% to completion. We're going to get rid of both of those protons. That wouldn't be on the H2SO4. That wouldn't be the case if we were doing a, a standard um, Bronsted model of the, of the of reaction. And again, we're going to make water. Again, let's do water as HOH. That'll help us to see what's going on. Notice that we have that two of the subgroup of the on the H2SO4 because we have the two minus here, which means we need a subscript two on the sodium to make sodium Na2SO4, and that's gonna be aqueous. Now, H and OH, in order to get two sodiums, we need to have two sodium hydroxide, so put the two in front there, that's gonna be important. And then, um, we'll see that we have two OHs, we have two Hs, and so we're gonna get two HOHs, we're gonna get two waters out of this. And that's always gonna be the case. If you have a subscript of a two or a three, that's the number of water molecules you're gonna get out of this. Don't come up with, with weird looking chemicals, right? Just put together a salt, look for what the salt is. You've got sodium and you've got sulfate, so there's the salt, the sodium sulfate, and then the H and the OH come together to make water. Okay, coming back to our burette readings. So we can see as we come down, oh, I don't know if you see that, but I've got something that just appeared on my screen. Um, we come down 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, 9.5, 9.6, and then we're going to estimate, as we learned about way back in unit two, that that's at about 0.63, so we're going to say 9.63 milliliters is the volume of the initial reading. When we're done with the titration, now here is where our our reading is, where our the vo um, the volume of the sodium hydroxide is, and you know what? Let's that doesn't look quite. Um, there we go. And I'm going to call that, so this is 9.63. I'm going to call that, notice we're at 23, 20, uh, this is 24. Sorry, there's the 24 mark. And so, uh, sorry, that's not the 24 mark, that's the 25. 24 mark is hidden right in here. So 24.1, 24. .1, 24 
0.16 milliliters will be the final volume. And so we now have the way, the, all the information we need to find the molarity. We'll deal with the volumes in a moment. We'll bring those down in just a moment. But what we're going to do is use stoichiometry in order to find the moles of the sodium hydroxide and from the moles of the sodium hydroxide and the volume, we can find its concentration. We're gonna start with the acid, the moles of the acid. And you can do this all in one step if you want to. I've broken it down just to make it easy. We're gonna start with the volume, 10.00 milliliters. You know what, let's put another zero in there just for some more sig figs. 10.00 milliliters. We know the concentration, 3.00 moles of the sodium of the hydro uh, of the sulfuric acid over 1,000 milliliters, and that's going to give us 0 0.0300 moles of H2SO4. Now, stoichiometrically, this is how we're going to make the two uh, the the moles of the H plus equal to the moles of the OH minus. The moles of the hydroxide, and it is hydroxide. Um, if we did a net ionic reaction, it would be, the sodium would go away. So sometimes I, I drop the sodium. It's okay, you don't have to. Moles of the sodium hydroxide is gonna start with our 0 0.0300 moles of the sulfuric acid. And the ratio in the balanced equation is that we have two moles of sodium hydroxide for every one mole of sulfuric acid. We can cancel out the moles of sulfuric acid. I didn't cancel out the milliliters up above. And that's going to double our concentration, double the number of moles, 0 0.0600 moles of sodium hydroxide. We're almost done now. The molarity of sodium hydroxide, the concentration of the sodium hydroxide is equal to the moles divided by the volume. So take that 0 0.0600 moles, divide that by the volume, which is 24.16 minus 9.63 milliliters. I'll put the milliliters outside. And then to get it into liters, multiply by 1,000 milliliters over one liter. And when you do that math, then you will get the answer 4.13. That doesn't look like a three, 4.13 molar sodium hydroxide. So once you get down the idea of doing this titration, Hopefully the con the calculations are looking pretty familiar for you. All right, so I will post this and uh, the homework that goes along with this. The homework is going to include the worksheet that that is accompanying this, and also the first two post lab calculations calculating the concentration of the um, of the acetic acid in molar, and then follow the directions to find out what the percentage by mass of the acetic acid is, and we will go over those calculations next time in class. All right, so um, have a good rest of your day, and I will see you next time in class.